Welcome to the Million Vegan Grandmothers podcast. And today I am so honored to have Dr. Claire Lindsay, PhD. She's the Deputy Director of Oxford Center for Animal Ethics and Research Fellow in Animal Ethics at Wycliffe Hall, University of Oxford. She's also the Francis Power, is it Cabe? Professor. Oh, Okay, <laughs> Professor of Animal Theology at the Graduate Theological Foundation. In addition, she is Director of the annual Oxford Animal Ethics Summer School. She serves as a co-editor of the Journal of Animal Ethics and co-editor of the uh, Palgrave Macmillan book series on animal ethics, which has been published, which has published more than 40 books on animal related issues. She's the author of Developing Animal Theology and the co-author of An Ethical Critique of Fur Factory Farming. Yes, we really have to stop that immediately. Her co-edited volumes include Animal Ethics for Veterinarians, which I would love to pass on to my daughter. She's a veterinarian and not a plant-based veterinarian. The Palgrave Handbook of Practical Animal Ethics, and more and more and more. So, wow, it is such an honor to have you here, Dr. Claire Lindsay. And Dr. Silash Rao said you must interview this woman after he was at Oxford. So thank you for being here. Oh, wow. Well, thank you, Tammy. It's wonderful to speak to you today. Great. So we're just going to have a nice organic interview. And I want you to share what's what's deepest in your heart right now, what you're working on. I know that there's some some work that you're doing in Scotland. Uh, uh, Bill's just in the process of being um, looked at. And maybe you can share a little bit about that. And then maybe you can go on to the a wider piece. I uh, It's interesting. I was just speaking with a very good friend of mine, Jeff Francis, who's been a vegan for over 50 years. He knows your father well. And I just think of these vegan circles uh, have as going on and on and on. I love your puppy. <laughs> Looking <laughs> wants to be part of the interview. I love he it. Likes, he likes to be part of the situation. Um, yes. So I'm a co-author of a, um, a report. It's called Killing to Kill, um, an ethical assessment of predator control their words, not mine, um, on Scottish moors. Um, so right now, the Scottish government is uh, considering their wildlife management and Muirburn uh, bill. And basically, it's its goal is to address um, some of the practices that happen on grouse moors in Scotland. Um, grouse moors, people typically think of as a you know, beautiful landscape, but actually they're incredibly managed um to create um the aesthetic that it has um one of those things is mule burn that's where they burn the mules um and uh that's so there are more shoots and the grouse eat the shoots so everything they do on the moors is designed um so there are more grouse so they can shoot grouse um but in the process they kill about it's hard to how to know the exact numbers but they kill about a quarter of a million animals each year in order so that they go on and then kill about half a million grouse each year um all for fairly negligible economic gain um so the league against cruel sports asked us um to they commissioned this independent report into what happens on the moors um and basically they trap snare and poison all of those animals and it's it's fairly um it causes an enormous amount of suffering uh before they die and so we were looking at the justifications for it um economic it's really very very negligible um grouse the grouse industry in general creates about the same amount of revenue as a big tesco's um or other supermarket chain for those of you not in britain um uh traditions but obviously we know that culture is not static um that things change and that actually um just because things used to happen in the past that's not actually a good enough reason for them to continue in the present um and uh you know the biggest argument they make is that yeah it's kind of conservation we kill one animal for the extent to save another animal but when you look at things on a population level, 
uh, killing uh, foxes, weasels, stoats, um, hasn't increased the number of endangered species um, uh, that are around in Scotland because actually the reasons for decline in uh, those species like papakales is and lapwings is actually it's rather complicated. Um, um, I'm sorry, Max. Oh. Um, so <laughs> apologies for the dog. Um, so yeah, our our report is really aimed at um trying to bring awareness to the suffering um of those animals because it happens mostly in private lands or private estates. Uh, Scotland has, um, in terms of land equality, um, uh, one of the most inequitable divisions in the West. Um, about five hundred people own about half of Scotland, and they decide what happens on their land, and there's very little oversight for that. Um, and so really, we wanted to bring some awareness to it. They're at stage two of the bill, and they're considering licensing um things. We're less fond of the idea of licensing because that's really just institutionalizing cruelty um but uh we hope that they might go the way of whales and ban snares um or at least ban some of the methods of predator control even if they don't stop the practices entirely as we would like wow predator control i just i just was going to have an interview with camilla uh fox from mm -hmm. she lives in the California area and she's a coyote project coyote I think it's called and she just felt that it wouldn't be in her best interest to have an interview with the million vegan grandmothers because they are working with ranchers and even though she's vegan herself is they're trying very hard to get ranchers to stop killing the quote-unquote predators and mm -hmm. find other more humane ways of keeping them away from their live soon to be dead stock so yeah very interesting when we use the word predator control mm. because we know that whenever we feel that we have the right to control the wild we annihilate all of it i mean in the percentages of the wild animals that are left there's compared to the domesticated um, animals such as ourselves and all of the animals that we eat for um, for greed and um, violence is only 4%. There's only 4% of wildlife left. Yeah. And we know that when the wildlife is gone, we're gone. So, yeah. I mean, I think part of the report uh, really focuses on that, actually. We, we look at the language around predators grouse moors pests you know and it's amazing the language we use to decide which animals matter and where they should be and where they're allowed to be and we attempt to control and construct their environment with whilst all the while giving very little consideration to whether we have the rights to do that whether we even know what we're doing um i mean i think uh, I was talking. Um, uh, I was talking about some about this issue just the other day, and I, he was like, "Well, you know, if you're not going to do predator control, what are you going to do?" Well, they make it sound like lethal predator control is the only option. There are non-lethal options. Um, they just haven't been explored because they are more expensive, and it all comes from an idea that we know what's best. Whereas actually, I think the world needs places with our absence. You know, we need to let be um, and step away. You know, one of the greatest things I've seen uh, come out recently was the idea that we were going to have, I think it's by the goal is by 30% of the ocean by 2030 is going to be protected and we're not going to be a part of it. It's great. You know, the idea that we can actually step back from part part of the world and let other creatures um, and other beings occupy that space without human interference. I think that's, that's essential, not just for their own lives, but also for our futures. You know, we need spaces. The world needs spaces where humans are not, you know. Mm. 
Well, I had a podcast with Captain Paul Watson, and he was at our last convergence. We have a convergence coming up January 27th and 28th on climatehealers.org. We we provide um, a gathering place every three months for our beloved communities to come together and share new documentaries. And um, this one is on healthy me, healthy planet, and making that connection between a healthy planet is a is a healthy human. You know that mm-hmm. that that deep connection, which is so true. I mean, even looking at our gut, it's such an interesting form of study right now. And we know that it's what I did my master's on is the gut microbiome and plant-based nutrition and lifestyle. So we do know that a healthy gut is a one that's a whole food plant-based gut and that the earth that we're partaking in, you know, that we're either praising praising or poisoning with chemicals and um, death and suffering food is going to show up in our own health. And so when we look when we look at this, and and I'm talking to Captain Paul Watson, he said even this so-called protected land uh, of the oceans is not actually being protected. There, he's uh. constantly stopping ships going into this area. And so what he's calling for in order to save humanity, and which would save the sperm whales, I don't know how many are left now that are almost extinct, the commitment that he made to one sperm whale that saved his life and then died for him in trying to stop a ship that he was trying to stop that was going to basically to probably take his ship. As he tried to intervene, he made a commitment right there and then that he was going to do everything he could to stop whaling. And he said, we must leave the oceans alone. So then there won't be this, okay, well, this land's protected, but there's going to be these pirates, these these poachers that come in and, and just decide, mm-hmm. you know, through the night that when the oceans are completely left alone, it's our only chance, really. And you're saying the land too. So what will happen if we leave the land alone? Will it naturally come back? Because a lot of the reason we're killing, quote unquote, predators is because they're going after domesticated animals and we don't need domesticated animals and they're pushed out of their home i have so many people even in my neighborhood out in the country that are worried about the coyotes in the spring that are yipping and yapping for their pups they want us to stay out of their zone because they're yipping and yapping you know to keep their pups safe but their land is being encroached on encroached on so people say well Mm -hmm. now they're bothering us well they need their land back and that's what you're saying you know Let's yeah, just I, I think they do need their land back. And, um, it, you know, I think we need to think much more seriously about what we're doing with the land. I mean, one of the issues we talk about in the report is poisoning, which actually gets very little thought. Uh, rodenticides, um, which are used, marketed to kill rats, right? Um you know, people don't think about at all um, what what they're doing when they kill a rat. I mean, they're not just killing a rat. A rat takes about seven days to die in um, three to seven days. And it's uh, it's agony, you know, it's internal bleeding. And during that time, they don't stay in one place, right? So then they get eaten by other animals. And then those animals die too. And then you're putting that poison into the land it doesn't just go anywhere right I mean it's not like after it's been eaten it still then goes into another body of another animal into the soil you know we need to give much greater thought to um, what we're doing uh, when we decide this animal is a pest and we don't want to keep this one and you know and I I mean the report is focused on Scotland but the reality is that trapping snaring poisoning happens to free living beings throughout the world you know there is no place in the world that isn't doing some level of controlling the natural environment and uh you know i I think humans have a history of um thinking they know what's best um and uh generally getting it wrong (laughs) you know even with things like reintroductions it's brilliant to think that there might be beavers. Um, I wrote about this earlier this year. I just thought, how wonderful they're going to reintroduce beavers 
a bank in Scotland and it's a protected animal. Um, but then, of course, beavers do what beavers do and they created wetlands and uh, farmers didn't really like that they created wetlands. And so then um, the Scottish government gave them um, permission to shoot some of them, even though they're an endangered animal. And so, you know, things like rewilding, rewilding an area where we simply step back and nature takes its own course, that seems fine to me. But the idea that we should intervene, I think is tricky because the truth is, I'm not sure everybody has the moral generosity required to allow the reintroduced animals um, the space they need to live. I mean, you mentioned coyotes, but it's, um, it's the same in wol with wolves. You know, they're protected in parts of America, like in Yellowstone. But once they step outside the park, they're not protected. Um, and obviously, <laughs> wolves don't respect our boundaries. You know, they go wherever they need to go. And so I think we have to be careful about, um, you know, reintroducing animals, um, which we're not going to allow to continue to live in the way in which um, they need to. So I think, um, you know, it's one of those things where we have to think carefully about these issues. And um, and really, I think education is the key. It's why I do what I do. I think telling, explaining to people, you know, about sentience, why animals matter, why the rest of creation matters, um, you know, is essential really um, to, to moving us towards a more peaceable world, you know, with each other, with other beings, which I think has to be the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, I love, no, I love your little furry friend there. Mine just sits on the couch all day. <laughs> yeah, he, he likes to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So before this, this podcast started, I was watching a video of yours that you did at uh, for vegan church. And I was, I was wondering, how does someone like Claire become Claire? And I was I was looking a little bit at your dad, Andrew's work, and how you probably were raised in a very theologian, a, a vegan centric theologian world to some degree. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you became um, such a spokesperson to the religious community, the spiritual community saying, you know, this, we have been a little bit lied to here. We haven't been told the truth about that animals are sentient beings that have emotions and feelings and higher functioning and reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you watch what they do for each other and for their, their human friends. I mean, they're incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, yes, I, I, I accept it was rather an unusual upbringing. Um, I became vegan probably, uh, gosh, about 12 years ago now, but, um, I've been, I was raised vegetarian and being vegetarian in the eighties in England was very odd experience you know um there wasn't enormous amount to eat to be fair um and it's been enormously heartening to see the rise in all this plant-based food it's so much easier to be vegan now it's so wonderful um but yeah dad was chaplain to the uh university of essex when i was a child and so i was surrounded by um religious people it was a very interfaith environment um and uh concerned for animals i was raised to think that uh, to believe that god cares about more than human life um and the rest of creation that's really the foundation of where i begin i think it's a really simple insight but one that often gets lost i mean when you especially when you um when you believe in a theistic god you uh believe in the idea that humans are not god that there is uh, something greater than us and when you believe in god the creator um that is basically saying implicitly that creation is not ours to do with as we wish and i think that that is the central tenant um of everything i do um 
yeah we're actually I've actually I'm a producer of a film um it's called The Animal Thing and it um it's going to film festivals right now you can see us on theanimalthing.com uh when you see the trailer and actually it is a film about Andrew and his his life and his work for animals uh which will give you an insight um it's a uh, directed by my brother Adam who's a filmmaker in Los Angeles and so it'll give you a little insight into what it was like to be raised in a in that kind of environment I I it is quite unusual I thought everybody's parents were on television um uh arguing about animals or arguing about something um and it was only later that I realized that this was quite an unusual way to live one's life um but yeah so I was very lucky in that and then I studied theology I was interested in the questions of know how people's beliefs inform how they live their lives um and uh then uh later i came to uh running the Oxford center for animal ethics with andrew and i've been doing that for about 11 and a half years now so um it's an enormous privilege uh we have this wonderful group of fellows um who are always writing lots of projects so we're working on different ideas all the time um and we have a summer school each year, which is my favorite part of the year. It's four days in Oxford where it's about 153 different academics um, speak on different subjects. And this year's subject is animal thinkers. We're looking at the pioneers of the animal protection movement, which is very exciting um, because, wow. yeah, I mean, it's, I just feel I'm going to learn so much and be inspired. The idea is to critically engage with the people who came before us. You know, if you look at just Oxford, for example, the arguments people have here over animal experiments, John Ruskin was fighting them, <laughs> as was Lewis Carroll, you know, 150 years ago. So we are always standing on the backs of giants and it's it you know i think it's just so important to acknowledge where we've come from and really drink deep deep drink deep of the tradition of all traditions because there are so many insights we lose and we think that we're we're fighting each battle new with each generation but actually there's much to be learned from um where we've come before and who mm -hmm. came before us I love that because one of our grandmothers, Judy Carmen, her last book is called Homo Ahimsa. She said, you know, we call ourselves Homo sapiens, which means, you know, an intelligent one. And we're really not. Um, we need to become Homo Ahimsa, the people of mm -hmm. compassion. And I love that. Said, yeah, it's so beautiful. I think you'd love the book, uh, Judy mm -hmm. Carmen. And, and she said that the young people need to know that there's people that have been fighting for a very, very long time. And, you know, for her and Dr. Will Tuttle and some of the people in our community, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, some people. And, and so the young vegan activists who we just love and appreciate the grandchildren mm -hmm. of our, of our beings need to know that there were people here before them. So thank you. And I'd like to talk a little bit about your documentary as you spoke about it, but I would really like to invite you maybe to screen it at our next convergence. It, It's an animal thing. Is that what it's called? It's the animal thing. That's the name. The animal it. thing. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're very excited about it. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's under consideration at film festivals, so it's kind of watch this space at the moment, and then after that we'll be able to have screenings. Uh, but it's really, I hope it's, I hope it's relevant to more than just the animal movement. It's about, you know, a man who's given his life for a cause, um, you know, what that takes, so, and, you know, what that looks like. So it's, um, yeah, a lot, of, um, we, we had our first private screening of it, at the summer school last year and um yeah people really enjoyed it so yeah i'm optimistic <laughs> oh that's great how long is your film oh it's a full-length feature film it's like um 83 minutes long i think oh that's great <laughs> yeah. well hopefully in one of our upcoming convergences either in um april or july if it's available that would be lovely yeah. for you to come and, great. and share maybe you and your beloved father so what's it been like being 
part of the Oxford community. I know Dr. Silesh Rao just uh, and the community won the debate there on animal rights. And yeah, thank you for that. And thank you again for all your work that you do for the animals. The the awareness that you bring people, it's sometimes hard to watch, you know, really hard to watch, whether it's the exportation of of animals that are all dying in these ships, you know, like the sheep from Australia. I watched a little bit of footage on that on your Facebook channel and and just thank you because it is hard to look, but we must, right? We must. Yeah, I have a difficult relationship with seeing in a funny kind of way. I think, you know, I see so I I read so much horrible <laughs> things about the state of the world for animals um as part of my job. And it is it is hard, you know, and I think, you know, in my like to a certain degree and the images haunt me so although I find them beautiful and compelling and you know I think um the we animals media we often use a lot of their images they um Joe McCarthy takes some beautiful images but they are hard to look at you know some of them too and I think you know the awareness I think it's a strange relationship between seeing and awareness like some people know but they just don't want to know, right? And, you know, I think that's one of the harder things. Social media has helped us a lot in so many ways um, with people caring um, about the world. But then it's also, you can't say like you could in the 80s, oh, I didn't know, or, you know, all the knowledge is out there. And But so many people choose not to know, which I find hard. Um, so yeah, thank you. It is, it is difficult. Um, yeah, we keep, um, we keep trying. Oxford's a funny place, uh, to be for animals. I'm very lucky to have a very supportive, um, college, Wycliffe are, they're really wonderful and they, um, they've welcomed me and I'm new and they, they're very open to listening to people's views. But, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, it's still a difficult place in some ways for animals um but i think it's you know you have to make strides where you can and uh that's that's what that is but that's why the center um exists outside of the university um because um we like to help other academics who are trying to make a difference for animals who often can feel marginalized within their own communities i mean that's it's really um it can be very difficult for an animal uh, animal academic to write on things to get funding for that to you know to get their work appreciated um yours oh your work is good but that's not as important as other aspects of things and you see some shifts in that with the focus on climate change and those kinds of things but um generally um i think uh, it's still a more marginalized position. So the, one of the great joys of my job is that I get to try and help others um, uh, and support them in their work, which is really what the journal and the book series are about. You know, um, uh, it, I mean, it has to be excellent, obviously, but we love to publish um, groundbreaking work on animals. Um, we love to, you know, be a progressive voice for animals within the academy. Writing, you know, words are so powerful. And when they're put together with such academic passion, academic heart centered ways of, of being it, it's very impactful. So thank you so much for, for doing that. You know, a lot of us have great ideas, but we can't put it into the words the way that you're able to. So thank you for that. And um, if there's a couple things. If there's a way that the listeners can support or uh, carry your message forward, maybe you can let them know how that would be. And any final little things you would like to share in your work and, and the work um, that we can carry forth. Uh, because this is the only way that we're going to actually get through to the other side of, of the crisis we're in. I mean, it's a the connection with war and animal agriculture, the connection with poverty and animal agriculture, the connection with abuse, stealing young young away from their mothers. I mean, it just goes on and on, is all connected to animal agriculture. And so really, if we can, if we can turn a blind eye to an animal suffering, we can turn a blind eye to human suffering. Mm -hmm. 
And so we know that we are in the great awakening. And I believe that we are going to be predominantly a vegan culture by 2026. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, that would, that, I mean, that would be amazing. <laughs> That'd be really amazing. I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's enormous privilege and enormous responsibility to live in the time we're living now, you know, um, it, because if we don't change, if the world doesn't change, and if we don't help the world change, um, the world won't continue in the way in which it has been. So um, I think it's an enormous challenge um, facing us right now. I'm I'm enormously proud to do my part of that. I mean, the whole goal is to try and help people think differently about animals, to try and reach people, to try and educate people in whatever way we can. Um, you can uh, look at our website, which is OxfordAnimalEthics.com. We're also on Instagram. Um, and uh, yeah, do do support the animal thing, the movie. That would be wonderful. Um, we're trying to create a little buzz around it because that helps with film festivals. Um, and yeah, you can get involved. Come to a summer school. They aren't just for academics. They are, and they're a really wonderful, uplifting experience. Just the other day, somebody wrote to me to tell me that it was magic what happens there. And I can't quite explain it, but people leave uplifted. Um, so that is a wonderful thing. And, you know, buy a book um, it, that's, uh, you know, become educated in something new. We, um, we've published two books in the last 18 months on fur and the ethics of fur, which is an interdisciplinary book or uh, a critique of fur factory farming, which is really a tool for those people who want to try and um, move the dial legislatively. Um, it critiques all the arguments for fur um, and uh, offers, uh, you know, a, it's supposed to be a legislative tool, hopefully to be used by lawyers or, you know, other people who might try and use it to make a difference. Um, because actually I found that the moral arguments do move the needle and understanding what the moral arguments are can really help. So um, actually Andrew's book, Why I'm Suffering Matters, will be great for that too. Um, but if you're more interested in the spiritual side of things i recommend to you animal theologians um and that really looks at some of the great voices tolstoy schweitzer gandhi um martin buber you know people um in the last 300 years who have written on animals thought about animals more deeply before us and uh yeah that's published by up came out this year i'm very proud of that one so um sorry i realized it's got very dark behind me um <laughs> so um my my message to people is you know there is kind of no pure land with these things are uh, we all try and do our best and I think the key is just to incrementally educate people. Um, you know, as long as we're paying our taxes, our money unfortunately subsidizes animal agriculture and uh, a whole range of practices in animal experimentation we wouldn't want. So the key we is we just have to keep educating people until, until they hear us. And we need to make it as easy as possible as for people to change. I try my best to live my life as a vegan in a way in which other people don't feel judged um it's which is remarkably difficult when it is what you do with your life <laughs> but uh, i find that people don't make personal changes in their lives if they feel judged um it, they do if they um if they're curious if they're open to it, if you can just make it look like it's not that hard, you know, or that there is actually just a more peaceful way to live with the world. And peace, I think, is the message. It seems such a simple one, but it is the one I end up communicating the most. I think what the world needs is to move into Ahimsa deeply, move into a world of being in non-violence with each other, you know, um, and yeah, that's why, you know, humane education, I think, is such an important tool. It's a thing we need at all levels of our life and all levels of society. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps, but um, it's been a pleasure talking to you about it. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure. And 
we will see if we can get the links uh, for all of the books that you recommend at the bottom of this podcast. I will share that with our beautiful, um, our beautiful manager, Mac. Mm -hmm. And thank you again for your time, because that is where we're moving, humane education. And that has to include all beings, because... Mm -hmm. I just finished writing a, doll, a book with uh, my friend, Jeff Francis, artist, and uh, I would love you to see, I don't know if you've ever seen yeah. his um, his piece of art called Alternative Nativity, but I'll send it to you. And it's it's a beautiful scene of, you know, a nativity scene, but she's holding a, holding a baby in one arm and a lamb in the other. And, and then there's all these animal carcasses on a cross and it's very powerful because that is the alternative energy we're moving into the alternative knowing that we cannot we cannot be affect we cannot not be affected by eating pain and suffering and death and violence and one of my teachers said a little while ago who is a three board certified physician he said he used to ask people, you know, what's going on for them when they came in suffering with extreme anxiety. And now he asks them what they had for lunch. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for us to know that if we want to not suffer, which we're seeing a lot more human suffering than we ever have, a lot more fear and hopelessness, anxiety, stress, and depletion and a will to live in humans than we've ever seen on the planet, even in young people, it's, it's coming back to us, you know, it's coming back. And so the answer is to educate ourselves and to understand it's so easy to be vegan, whole food vegan. It's so easy. There's so much community to join now. I was yeah. doing asked yesterday with a woman and she said, well, I still really like my hamburgers, but when the, you know, when most people go vegan, I will too. And I'm like, Hmm, I bet there's a lot in that school because yeah. they don't, because we're social creatures. And if they ha cannot have dinner with all of their friends and all of their family, um, they think that's a tragedy. But I want to just end with some good news is that you can, I just bring two dishes everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can. And there are so many more options and there are so many more places for you to experience that um, now. And I feel like, um, you know, uh, it sounds like a really incredible um, painting by Jeff, but I mean, it's really interesting Oh, sorry, a bit of a tangent, but it's a really interesting from a theological perspective. When people think of the nativity, they think of the animals who are there. But what they don't think about is that the animals are there for a reason, symbolically speaking. They were, you know, the point is, is that if you are a Christian, you believe that the Christ event, um, his birth, um, is significant for all creation. And that's why the animals are there. It is not just about humankind, you know, and actually um, John Henry Newman, the Cardinal, wrote specifically um, comparing the suffering of uh, lambs um, and, uh, in slaughter and the sufferings of Christ on the cross. So there are direct religious parallels there too so if you are if you are Christian, there is an enormous amount of resources for you out there. Great. Maybe I could imagine Jeff's painting being on the cover of one of your animal um, ethics books coming up. So thank you very much for your time. This thank has been so a much. real honor. Yeah. <laughs>